Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our How to Repair Pendulum Clocks live stream. And um, I see we have people there already, which I'm slightly surprised at. It's such a beautiful evening here in uh, York. So uh, welcome wherever you are. And thank you for coming along when you could be out uh, at, down the pub uh, having, a, having a nice time. But anyway, uh, we don't have anybody um, on the live chat yet at our end, although we are expecting one or more or fewer of our Open Clock Club team. So I'll just tell you uh, where we're at. For new people here, then a super special warm welcome, particularly beginners and particularly, of course, people who bought our book. Uh, which is lingering up there behind the camera, just about to see it. And um, it's been a good week on the uh, writing front. Um, many of you will roll your eyes, but we've been writing uh, Hi Ken, Two Kens, Hi Two Kens. And um, they, uh, we've been writing a couple of chapters about uh, depthing and bushing, which have now turned into a 60 page pre-publication and we uh everything 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 crossed we'll get to the final draft we had a, a good day of it today uh, so we're hoping to launch that not this weekend but next weekend uh, anyway um as always the facebook group uh, is kind of growing i wouldn't say exponentially um because i don't quite know what that means uh, john isn't here to help me out on the math so um it's growing like crazy uh <laughs> Or clocky term. So thank you to everybody uh, who's joined us. And hopefully there's somebody here this evening who's joined the Facebook group recently. And um, super special thank you to those people as well, the regulars who keep that group going with your uh, support and uh, answers. And of course, it's lovely to see your projects, whatever they may be. Um, we've got a, a Comtoise thing going at the moment, a Comtoise clock. And uh, I bought a little sort of um, souvenir Black Forest type clock with a plastic bird stuck on the front of it on the palette arbor, which is quite cute. But that's interesting, actually, because it's um, it's got some pretty severe paint loss issues. In fact, I've just moved it again and you just kind of look at it and the paint pings off. So uh, anyway, we'll be. Hi, Derek Franklin uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, nice to see you there. And Ian, so all good. So uh, what do we do here on our live stream? Well, it's it seems like a slow old process, but I guess clock making and clock repair is it's just normally not quite so stop start as it is here. So a few months ago, we got an early 19th century European tall case clock and uh, it's got some bits missing, but the case is there and the pendulum's there and the weights are there. So most, most of it's there. And uh, we've been working through some repairs and last week because we kind of hit a midlife crisis, project crisis, rather than stalling on the whole thing, uh, we, we decided, I decided to, um, to concentrate on the going train. So at least within the next week or so, we can get the going train up and running, which will give us a bit of a boost to go back to the striking train where we've got a pretty significant uh, challenge with our gathering pallet, arbor and uh, gathering pallet. But anyway, that it'll all happen in the end. Uh, hopefully before our summer recess, we can get the whole thing uh, running. Hi, Jim from Canada. Nice to see you. Uh, truly international audience this evening. So anyway, uh, one of the many uh, jobs that we have to do on this clock is re-pivoting the centre arbour rear uh, pivot. Now, um, this was actually broken off, or it was kind of broken down to a stub about half its original length, so we filed it off. There wasn't really any way around that. Um, I presume it had just rusted and, uh, and broken or worn away or something. Who knows? Uh, the whole clock had been sort of dropped on the floor or something. So we straightened up the front end of this uh, centre arbor. but that's not my dock, by the way. And um, last week, found the centre using uh, this device here, Lantern Runner, and um, uh, drilled it out one millimetre with tungsten carbide. So this week, we're going to finish the drilling, drill it out to diameter, which is about 
five, we decided, I think, and turn a bit of blue pivot steel, pop that in, true the whole thing up, and hopefully uh, get it between the plates. So that's my kind of aim for this evening. So um, I've been just, so I, that's right, made a drill. Here's my drill. It's just uh, exactly the way I show it in, uh, there's a video on this on one of the YouTube channels, the kind of regular channel, how to make a drill out of a bit of steel. And so this takes about half an hour, something like that. I made this one and then tempered it back a bit. But what I've found is often the case is that you begin to drill in, get drilled in about half a millimeter. Hi, Jeremy. And um, the, uh, the drill goes blunt. And so you begin to work hard on the surface. Now, it seems that we've gone over pivot drilling and pivot replacement quite a lot. But I think that's worth it because in the past couple of weeks, maybe a bit more than that. We've had three uh, cases where people have really gotten themselves into a lot of trouble, either taking on um, uh, work where it was it was too difficult or just um, maybe broken a pivot off by accident. So my advice is rather than get yourself into that situation where it's kind of like panic, uh, I'm never going to be able to do this is to just get some old arbors or bits of steel or something and practice because I'm not particularly, uh, I would never say I'm a sort of um, practitioner. I know many people who are much, much better practitioners than I am, but certainly in this last two or three weeks, uh, I feel I've improved such a lot just by taking on these slightly more challenging uh, projects. Sounds like Team Open Clock Club has just come in. And um, so practice is the answer. Get some arbors, particularly those tricky little French clock uh, arbors where the pivots are very hard and they can break uh, for whatever reason, um, sort of like 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 of a millimeter. This is kind of quite easy, although it's surprisingly um, hard. Now, what I've been doing, I started drilling. Uh, so I made a drill, it went blunt. I re-hardened it and didn't temper it back. And um, so obviously the problem with that is a bit like carbide. Um, it's great as long as it's great, but the harder the drill is, the more chance and the thinner and the sharper, as in the pointier, the more chance there is of breaking off. So you're kind of always running a, um, a little bit of a, a sort of a balance, a compromise between those things. So what I was doing, I was just drilling by hand like this. Um, I've moved away from the hog spit this week, if you can see that but um, using a bit of turpentine as a, as a lubricant. I thought the spitting on it does work really well, but it was a bit gross. And I remember fondly, um, now of course, people watching this might say, now wait a minute, Matthew, that arbor's wobbling about like crazy. But because the drill is like a <laughs> crazy long bit of metal, just follows the center. Uh, I could put the, lantern runner on to give it some support and put a bit of oil on there a bit of something on there anyway um and drill through the center oh here's um here's a member not our normal member of uh open clock club so if there are any qu um questions then we have a novice at the at the at the keyboard so sorry yeah yeah you'll see we've got one two three four five six seven we've got eight people and most of them are our regulars so um they're super friendly and um they never ask any difficult questions but i must actually concentrate on this because i heard it kind of making a terrible noise so i'm keeping everything crossed that the drill isn't going to break off in the hole um if you follow the Facebook group, you will have seen Ian during the week uh, left one of his super friendly, helpful posts about Eureka drills, which are a, a drill with a straight flute and really good for this kind of work. I imagine quite a bit stronger than my uh, little blue steel drill that I'm using here, but it's drilling quite well. I don't know what you can hear on there, um, here, here on the microphone that it's, Drilling, you can see the swarf there. So 
So as long as I can hear that kind of slightly rough sound, I'm happy because I know it's cutting. The minute it starts to skid, then you must stop drilling because all you'll do is either break the drill or work hard on the surface. As soon as it stops drilling, then stop and sharpen your drill. Otherwise, you're just going to press harder and harder and harder. Because if you've got a machine tool, then that sometimes can work because you've got a lot of... Um, see the swath coming out, which is like really satisfying. So I'm going to drill to the bottom of the hole here. And... Um, Hello, novice. Surely that's not your name. Oh, it's it, I, 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 maybe it doesn't have a name. Open Clock Club. Um, novice just finished its O level A levels, so big celebration! Yay! Um, so it's making some terrible noises, but I like that because that tells me that the drill's hard, and um, it's actually doing some good. I'm just drilling slowly because. I don't want the embarrassment of the drill breaking up in the hole. But you can see the swarf there. It's building up quite nicely. I'll just put a bit more turpentine on it. Oh, yeah, I was telling you the story, wasn't I? I think I've told you before of um, going to uh, one of the watch schools in Germany where they had these beautiful rose engines and straight line engines, and they lubricated those cutters with wintergreen oil. And I thought, mm, I must buy some wintergreen oil. Uh, it looks like you're going to have to tell me your name. Um, She's just looking her name up. All right. Um, a winter green oil. And so I thought, well, I'm, I want to buy some of that, but actually I didn't buy any. Of course, I realized that I've got turpentine spirit, which presumably is a similar thing. Now, we were really lucky last week, I think, with this um, carbide drilled nice and deep, which is good. I did one repivoting during the week at point five millimeters so not tiny by sort of watch standards but you know french clock thing and of course the key to it is getting the drill deep enough um because then you have got a lot lot better chance of the pivot not dropping out um i'm going to put a little brass sleeve on this uh, end of this arbor in a bit just stop it from splitting a temporary little measure temporary measure See loads and loads and loads of swath there. So pride comes before a fall, a little bit more oil on it. If you don't see the swath coming out of the hole, then again, it's not drilling and you should stop and see what the problem is. Um, I think we've been through this on the Facebook group again. Right. I, you probably can't hear that, but all of a sudden it's changed. Uh, it's gone from a kind of churning, gr uh, cutting sound to a kind of more skidding sound. And I think what it's done is it's just reached the bottom of the hole, uh, which is fine. I don't need to drill any deeper. The, the hole's quite deep. Um, yeah, I think with the, could keep going a bit, but I don't think it's necessary. We've got a good deep hole, lots of uh, healthy looking swath coming out there so let's just have a look give it a bit of a puff and peer down the hole yay great really happy with that um how deep is the hole uh let's just find a ruler It. So has everybody got good weather at the moment then, wherever you are? Good old English uh, English question. What's, uh, I imagine on the continent, I was looking at, um, just happened to in my break, looking at a video of the Nürburgring this afternoon and saw that the, uh, they've got the same kind of weather as us, not unsurprisingly. What's the weather like in Canada? Have you got the same kind of thing, wet and few showers? Yeah, it's cool. Um, if you can see there, looking at the drill, I mean, it didn't have a lot of work to do because the hole was already a millimetre diameter, but it is still dead sharp on the corners. It makes such a difference. When I tempered it back, I used the spirit lamp and it was the palest straw. Um, 
this is in focus as I can get. Um, it will be. It um, anyway, and you stay dead sharp. So that kind of drilling a small hole and then opening it up has really worked for us there. Anyway, so there we are, A levels. Cool. And there's the, uh, let's just see if the old camera will focus that close. See that nice deep hole there. So that's going to give us every opportunity to make sure our pivot is sound. And um, again, you know, we want to sort of avoid uh, disaster scenarios um, with our clock making. There's, there we are. Um, so I'm going to put um, a bush on here just temporarily, temporary, like that, just a little bit of brass, brass, even that I've um, brooched out, might just brooch out a little bit more, uh, if I can find the brooch. Mm, every tool, usual Thursday, sort of midweek um, craziness, every tool I've got out there. So we just want to tap that on. Now it is against the shoulder here of the pivot. So we should just be able to gently tap it on. And then I uh, haven't quite decided how, but then I'll just turn off the excess. So what I'll do, I'll try to be clever. Um, always a mistake, isn't it? I wonder whether I should heat it up first and tap it on. No, maybe not, that's been too clever. And I'm just going to turn off the um, the end of that. That's nice and firm. So that was brooch. So it's tapered on the inside. Brooch is tapers really, really cool um, uh, process. And um, I mean, this arbor actually, there's quite a lot of meat left around there. But you will see that um, there's the cutter, you know, the bottom the of the addendum of the wheel, uh, of the pinion, sorry there so um this is just kind of a it's a bit of an insurance policy but it's well worth it because of course if the arbor splits or begins to crack then you have to leave some kind of sleeve on it which is fine but then the pivot really never wants to stay in the hole and you've got to start gluing it and all that kind of stuff so i'm just going to turn that down a bit i'll find uh, the center for the lathe somewhere all oh, right, okay. That thing is the thing. What did you burn? What did I burn? Where? Oh, I burnt my hair, I think, set fire to my hair. Yeah, you missed that today. I've um I've already been setting fire to things, uh hardening and tempering the drill. But that's um I just thought I'd better do that as a bit of prep because uh, you've seen it already and it's on the video as well. Um, but we've got plenty, uh, plenty uh, setting fire to things up ahead. So don't worry. We've, remember, we've got that silver soldering, which I don't think we've covered at all, have we, in, um, in these sessions or on the video. So I just supported the end of the arbor there. And um, ah, that would help, wouldn't it? Put that on first. That, if we can squeeze that in there. Oh, touch in there. Touching the wheel. Oh, quite a tight squeeze in there. Maybe I should have just turned the bush down to start with. That would have helped, wouldn't it?
Oh, there we are. I can hear it squeaking. So I'm like, oh. Should quieten it down a bit. Good. And I'll just get a graver. You can see where I put them. Oh, there they are. And turn it off. It's always tempting to leave these things on. Um, oh, I know what I can show you. Um, top tip. Get a scalpel blade. I can't remember if I've shown this before, but um, and turn it into a parting tool. So when you uh, have got something like this you want to cut off, um, here's our trusty uh, yellow stone that you've seen many, many times before, ceramic, 1,000 grit ceramic stone. So what I'm going to do is first, uh, let's just focus in a bit here, is to blunt the blade. I'm going to cut my finger off. And then just um, sharpen the end of the scalpel to form a mini parting tool. So let's see if that works. Um, it's really good when you're making um, bushes out of bushing wire and you want to, you know, in, in, um, you, know you can saw them off with a piercing saw. But uh, then, of course, you've got to turn them around and finish the back because it's not smooth. Whereas if you do it like this, if it works, it saves a lot of material. I mean, that bushing wire can be quite expensive. There we are. So um, there we go. It was worth turning up, wasn't it? After all, top tip, uh, turn your scalpel into a parting tool. It does mean rather frustratingly though that the scalpel blade of course if you forget and you come to cut something with it it's totally blunt but um there we are there we go uh i might leave that on who knows right okay so the next thing we need to do is get our wire our uh, wire that's going to become our pivot and begin to turn it down this hole's about point for something with those homemade drills, you kind of never really know what size the hole is going to uh, turn out at because, of course, um, if the drill isn't ground quite on the centre, then it tends to uh, drill over size. But what I do know is, or I do hope, in fact, that it's smaller still than our, yeah, 0.6. So it's somewhere between 0.4 and 0.45, I imagine. But it doesn't matter because we're going to make this our new wire to fit uh, this chap here. So we can take that out now. And I'm just gonna clean the, um, clean the hole again, just to check there isn't too much swarf in there. Otherwise it will the pivot won't go in, right? And I think again, with those drills, I did have to sharpen it. So I do leave a little bit of parallel material there, but there's a chance that when you resharpen that it's not the same center. So typically the hole tends to get smaller, which is quite good because it, it'll give us our sort of wedging action that we're after. Yeah, the hole's pretty clean. It's just gonna get a bit of um, peg wood and poke about in the bottom of the hole. Definitely my preferred way of um, sharpening pegwood is with a file. Do sometimes do it with a with um, a knife as well. But a really coarse new sharp file is um, I actually find you get a better better job with it. You get a finer point. But anyway, put myself in the face with it now. How will it sharp as well? It's not the first time. So I didn't set fire to my hair, but I put myself in the eye, nearly with a bit of pegwood. So there's something, something for everybody on this show.
So just there we go. The little upper bear. I did use to have that sort of canned uh, aerosol clean air stuff, and that's kind of quite useful. Um, anyway, no longer. So just refocus a bit here. See what's going on. It's a, it has been a day of getting one tool out after the other, doing drawing before, which is quite nice to um, change between the two things. That is, uh, sometimes I, you know, think hard. Oh, it's quite, it's a nice um, job fixing clocks, and especially the way that we, we're sort of things that we're involved in at the moment. One moment it's photography, then it's drawing, then it's writing, um, uh, doing the Facebook. So it's uh, it's nice. It's a, a good life. Well, kind of, apart from the money, of course. But let's uh, let's gloss over that. So remember when you're turning with blue pivot steel, uh, cut the end off first because the end that's um, sheared seems to be like super hard, really difficult, and it's not round either. So we're going to uh, first get rid of that. How are we doing there, Hannah? Moodly UK 20 and Sunday. Don't forget a drop of oil. I use exacto scraper blade. Uh, da, da, da. Sunny in 17 in Ottawa. Brilliant. Of course, what we do is we stalk you all um, after we go on Google Maps and find out where you live and sort. So it looks nice there. And obviously that, that old question as well, have you been there, you know? Right. So I'm just using one of those. Um, actually, it's just a, a stub. It's probably completely blunt, I can't really say. Um, stub of a tungsten carbide drill that I've ground uh, to a pyramid point, but it's not cutting. So let's try something else. If I could let it down, which um, I think with with really soft arbors, like the Enfield type thing, I would let the steel completely down. It's still amazingly tough, even when it's been let down. And it means that it's a little bit more compliant. And so you're pushing this really, you're not pushing a really hard pivot into a relatively kind of soft hole, which can be a bit brutal. So um the beauty of not letting it down of course is you can get a better finish on the pivot you will know or not but um if you want the really best finishes then you need to uh keep the steel nice and hard that's why it's impossible to finish brass to a high finish you know uh, you can polish it but obviously in clocks it gets squidgy you know chronometers and things are uh not polished clocks aren't polished Apart from carriage clocks, of course, but let's um, draw a veil over that. Um, so, yeah, if you want to get a really high finish on your pivot, then you want to leave it hard. So I'm going to start by turning this down to size. Um, see a nice little bit of swath coming up there. Again, this stuff is never quick, unfortunately. It always takes an amount of time. So good job we're not in a particular rush. But once we get down to that stage, that is like the totally best brush, by the way, that I've ever found for machine tools. It's a bit big for this. It's an oval varnish brush by that um, Italian company there, Omega. It uh, seems like a bit of a luxury, but if you've got things like a drill press and a lathe and so on, um, I was always slightly dismayed um when i've been in workshops where they've got a, like a really plasticky cheap brush um could do with some tape on the ferrule but this oval varnish brush absolutely brilliant for uh, uh for um, machine tools and things i think that's a nice investment last forever uh, basically and they don't get sort of greasy too much like a plastic bristle brush does either so I'm just going to break off this end. Now I've, um, there we are. Easy peasy, he says. You could grind that, I suppose, if you were in a rush. 
but if you have um, a grinder with a you know a wheel with a sharp edge you could just put it on there and snap it off but again that seems a bit brutal okay so i'm going to start by turning now i should really use my eyeglass because again it's like impossible to see um and i'm going to change i might be okay might change the t-rest for a wider one There we go. Let's just see how we get on. So I've got a carbide graver. Should be able to use um, steel on this. I did before when I was making that drill and it turned okay. I'll, I'll just try uh, steel to get us going. This is round nose, so it's not the right tool for the job. But you can see, uh, yeah, carbon steel cuts fine. I mean, there's obviously not a great deal of difference in hardness between the steel and the carbide, but um, between the two bits of steel, I mean. So remember, we're cutting with the oblique end of the tool, um, not with the tool like that, like um, a lathe tool, because the end isn't supported, then it'll just tip up the whole time. So when you're uh, cutting with um, uh, a graver, then have the tool that way up. You can see it's much better supported that way, and you can see what you're doing, and it's and it's much easier to control the angle you cut above the center as well, which is kind of counterintuitive for. Um, I'm gonna have to use my glass. It's counterintuitive. Face, it's gonna be in the way, I'm afraid. Maybe I should get the longer T rest. It's forever slipping off. So the usual thing when you're putting two components together, um, start with quite um, uh, a steep angle cone, and then once you get the thing the in this case the male bit the pivot to be, start going into the hole then you uh make the cone more and more and more parallel which makes it a good fit if you start with it nearly parallel parallel what will happen is you it'll be too big too big too big too big then it'll be sloppy so in order to give yourself a kind of fighting chance start with quite a steep cone so you can get a mark when you put the two components together you get a witness mark and then you can begin bringing that cone more parallel. I'm going to start um, offering up the wheel to see when we're in the, the ballpark. Not yet is the answer. So a bit more off. And again, it's just one of those processes that it seems to take forever, but there's no real way around rushing it. I resigned myself as well to never really being able to drill the size for the pivot and just put a bit of parallel steel in and then leave it. You Drilling the way that I drill it anyway, especially with these homemade drills, that hole is just too wobbly. So you do have to put a bit of oversized material in there. And even if it's just skimming it, turn it down to size and to bring it nice and concentric and things, it just doesn't seem to work. It's a nice idea to drill a hole, put a bit of steel in, cut it off and then go home. But it uh, doesn't work like that, unfortunately. So I'm... Um, doing what I do, uh, which we're doing what I say, should I say, which is unusual. And uh, I don't know if you can see that, it's probably not zoomed in enough, it's as close as we can get. But uh, just put a bit of a cone on there, a bit of blue Sharpie pen, try it for size, and then we will have um, a little mark on the arbor. And that witness mark will tell us where we need to go to make, bring this whole thing more parallel. 
and we'll have a marquee set. I don't think the pen was dry. Yeah. Great. Okay. So I can start taking more meat off it now. Should have actually um, measured. In fact, I will do it if I can find the drill or something like it. Just measure how deep that hole was. I think it's about two mil. Let's have a look. Just put a little mark on. And measure up. Yeah, it's about two and a quarter millimeters. So that's good for a 1.4 millimeter diameter hole. I'm pretty confident that that's enough. And that uh, bit of steel, the drill I've marked now is quite useful because it tells me how much I need to turn down. Great, okay, so I'll just start a bit more off. Of course, remember that, of course, um, the thing is, it's so easy to get carried away and make it loose. And you've got to start again. Just going to try and tidy up the end where I broke it off because that's obviously going to be in that cone at the bottom of the hole. So it'd be really nice if that actually located in there. Okay, so I've taken a bit more off and uh, it's not quite at the stage yet where it'll begin to stick together. So a little bit more, again, just making it more and more parallel. Right, so um, you can see now it's just beginning to enter the hole proper, not much, um, three quarters of a millimetre maybe, but it's got to that point now where the two things are not holding it up, no hands, um, are sticking together. So we know that we're in the ballpark. Uh, now is not the time to take loads and loads and loads and loads off because it'll be too loose. Um, don't know whether I'm going to use any uh, Loctite on it yet. Uh, possibly not if I can help it. I don't really mind. Depends how um, how it goes. So again, just put a bit of blue on. Rub the two. Sorry, cat six, my hands in the way. Rub the two components together, and that'll give us another little witness mark. Can be a little bit careful doing that because it can actually wear the hole quite a bit, and then it just gets baggier and baggier and things that. So, yeah, we've not actually moved up the arbor much. A bit more off. Okay. 
The next stage is I'm going to go to stoning it. So I'm going to use either a Kansas or um, or uh, a sort of um, oil stone or something. Yeah, that's my next stop. What type, what type do you use? Uh, 271 for this, which is... Um, Sorry, the, the question was, what kind of Loctite do I use? Uh, in this one here, this is, I think this might be oil resisting um, and a lower viscosity. Uh, this is my favorite one for um, the Swan Automaton. It's got lots of strip thread, well, not lots, but a few strip threads on it. Uh, or this one, which I think is the same thing, but it's um, more viscous. So they're the two I use. But this kind of thing where you don't want it to come apart. If you want it to come apart again, then I use the medium strength one. Uh, uh, we'll still be in the tool bag. But um, yeah, I use the same version, but uh, medium strength. Never really use the low strength stuff. I've always found you can get the medium strength stuff apart quite easily. And with... Um, with a little bit of heat on it as well but um i would try to avoid well not avoid it on the, something like this but let's see if we can do it uh as it is without any uh, adhesive on it so i'm just going to start stoning now that will key up the surface and it'll also um flatten out a few of the uh a few of the marks that i put in it so Got um, probably a bit caught between two things. Here, there's uh, I think this is an oil stone. Yeah, that's an oil stone. It's not particularly flat. I'm just going to smooth it out a little bit on the uh, on the ceramic stone. A, um, probably you should cover the bed of your lathe when you're doing this as well with a bit of paper or something. Never with a rag, never with cloth, because on a powered lathe, um, if you cover the bed of the lathe, it can get caught up in the chuck and cause a nasty accident. But paper, paper towel or something to prevent abrasive from going down onto the lathe bed. Um. Hey, yeah. Gosh, we're team handed now. Oh, ice creams. Mm, don't really like that. That. The problem with that stone is it's just not flat enough. So I'm going to go to the uh, Arkansas, which is obviously finer, so it doesn't cut as quickly, but at least it's reasonably flat. And again, just going to flat it out on the ceramic stone, get a nice sharp corner, get it out of the way. So let's um, try that. That's going on nicely. There we are. How's that? Um, just maybe going to do, I'm just going to measure it again. But it's such a good fit. I'm really tempted just to call that it. Quit while you're ahead, as the, uh, as the saying goes. Let's... Um... <laughs> Is that not a saying? I think I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. <laughs> you know, when you've when you've done as much pivoting as I have, uh, no, <laughs> when 
after you've done this and it's I've spent so many years in uh pain over this of it not going right, the arbor splitting it being wobbly, not knowing. Uh, had I only had a great teacher like me to show me how to do it, <laughs> joking by the way, um, I would know that if you get it as good as this or as reasonable a fit as this, then just go for it. That's really, I've just put, put it on there and it's really quite firm, so I'm quite happy. But I just want to check how deep it is because we said about two and a quarter, didn't we? So I don't want to. Yeah, it's about a mil and three quarters. So I'm just going to do a little bit more, which is probably going to nudge it up. But um, anyway, so just a little bit more stoning and just bring that tape because it's still a little bit tapered. Well, it is tapered, obviously, otherwise it wouldn't be jamming in the hole. But if you can see there on the blue, the, the blue is really useful because I'm putting my finger underneath the kind of headstock side to um, work work on this end of the material more than the end that's already in the hole. I mustn't get too, so as soon as that bit of blue, and if you can still see it disappears, then I'm going to uh, stop. Try that. If that is good to go, which it yeah, not at all bad. Remember, I'm going to skim this down anyway, so we'll we'll get it into a position where it's reasonably uh, straight, something like that. So um, now, what we want to determine is uh, we need to probably the boat on this. You know, um, I mentioning no names, on some fora, people go crazy about whether the pivot's sticking out of the hole or it's a little bit shorter than the bearing. Um, it's not something that uh, exercises, is that the right word, exercises me? But maybe this pivot's a bit long. You think we should just whip a bit off it? Um, yeah. Again, is this whole disaster is going to happen if the pivot's a bit short for the hole? And I have seen it where the pivot kind of wears down inside because it pushes it forward. Oh, it reminded me about something. Um, don't always think that the pivots need to be parallel. Again, lots of obsessions about making pivots parallel. The uh, clocks by Whitehurst of Derby, uh, I've seen some where the, all the back pivots are actually quite tapered. And of course, they throw the arbors against the shoulders of the front pivots. So they were like that from new. So I kind of hate to imagine how many of those things. Um, that's our arbor, by the way. So have been um, filed parallel. Uh, anyway, so they're not always parallel. There we go. So tempting, isn't it? Never ever to work on this anymore because when it gets to that stage where it's actually straight, you think, gosh, I really should leave it. And it's a super good fit in there. Good. Anyway, that's enough self congratulation for now. <laughs> Everybody's wishing for it to go wrong. <laughs> Don't blame me. Don't blame you. So I'm going to cut it off, but I'm going to cut it off in two stages. Um, I'm going to cut uh, a bit off. Um, I'm going to cut it up into two stages. Tell you what, now what I should do if I'm just control myself a minute is measure. So yeah, if the pivot sticks out beyond the plate, so what? It it might look a bit funny, but um, so here's here's the plate. Plates two point nine. So let's call it three mil. Let's just measure up on here where three mil is, because we don't know how much it's going to tap into the hole, but it can't be more than about half a millimetre at the absolute most. Uh, so I just want to, lost my six inch ruler, I don't know where it went, anyway. I use my parting tool, come, scalpel, come, um, scratching stick. And um, oh gosh, 
it's going to that stage. It always seems to happen on a Thursday where it's mayhem with tools everywhere. And I've got a mark on there. What did we say? Three mil, was it? 2.9 or something? I'm going to mark three mil. One, two, three. Come, sir. So I'm going to start turning it off at about four. And just like when we shortened it before, um, we will uh, break it off or cut it, cut it off. The, thing, the reason why I break it off is because it's always when you cut to the middle that it breaks the tip off your graver. So. Okay, Derek's advice is measure twice, cut once. Measure twice, cut once. That's the advice of somebody who's also suffered much. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to think of the, the worst, um, oh gosh, so many experiences of doing that and it, and it not being right and saying, gosh, it can't be wrong. But also some really good ones. Um, we do learn, don't we, I, I hope, um, some things I'm trying to think of, uh, packing cases where we've measured and measured and measured and the object has just gone in the packing case like a dream. And these have kind of been two or three meters big sometimes. So you, um, yeah, it's interesting. Clock making again without sounding completely conceited is really useful for all sorts of things. And I think this is a point we made a bit with book one, that if you can get through that sort of pain barrier and um you know fix you know the enfield the single train enfield book uh clock thing get through that take the spring out put it back together again do all that stuff it's amazing how many transferable skills there are and when you work with um people who've got a proper job and they don't sit around measuring things the whole time um yeah it's it's really useful i think uh being a clock person john who I co-write with, or he co-writes with me, or whatever it is. Um, he's a car person. And since he's become a clock person, he's got his lathe and he can make components for his car. In fact, he's just sort of building one at the moment. Some, some old wreck. Anyway, right. Just cut this off. Derek says he made a new panel the other day. He marked it for cutting the fold and then cut it on the fold back. Yeah. <laughs> it happens, doesn't it? It happens. Um, yeah, it's easily done. I repaired a door here and it was so lucky, found a bit of wood and it just fitted perfectly. But, but then my, I sort of lost concentration and cut it at length rather than width. And so I had to kind of, and every time I look at it now, I think, oh my gosh, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Measure twice, cut once. Quite chunky bit of material. So. I don't want to break it up when it's too thick, otherwise, it'll bend it, no doubt. Oh, that's not too short. Always looks incredibly uh, short when you cut it off. Brush your brush. We're quickly like pulling a tooth out, and it doesn't 
hurt so much. Right, that's that. Let's just tap this in. Might put it back in the lathe, which again is probably um, classed as lathe abuse, but at least you can see it this way. And it's resting against the front of the uh, arbor there, the pivot. So let's have a look. It's probably a bit greasy with my fingers. Um, So I'm just going to rotate it a bit until I find a place where it's kind of in a. That's quite good. So um, the question is whether to put any glue on it or not. I might just try it as it is. So you can see I've left it miles too long anyway. So I'm going to, have to cut it again, which is always asking for asking for trouble. Uh, but anyway. Feel whether to glue. Whether to glue. I'm thinking I should glue it. I mean, it is a really, you can just push it in the hole and it like doesn't want to fall out. Yeah. This is where you're really happy to have that. Um, uh bush on there that that sleeve i wouldn't do that the whole time but it just gives you that slight sense of security that um that you're going to be okay right so we could turn the bush off now in fact we might have to do in order to hold the thing let's just go back this uh right i just need to Think through what's going to happen next. No, yeah, they decided not to glue it. Too impatient, but I'll probably pay pay the price in a few minutes because um, it'll be too. Uh, it'll fall out anyway. We'll see. Right. Okay. Um, so the next thing to do is to begin to straighten it up. So I'm just looking round for this badger. And I might try and use that to rest the pivot in like this uh, in order to begin to uh, straighten it. Not sure that's going to work. You can sometimes use the other kind that's got holes near the edge, a bit like turns, a bit like a Steiner turns, which are absolutely brilliant for this kind of thing. This is a bit big for them. But um, again, here, if I had the a big collet i could hold the pinion here um or what i could do is get the bush off of course and then yeah i'll do that i'll do that I'll stop mucking about turn the bush off and then we can um hold it in the lantern runner like we did last week and then begin to turn it down turn it to size uh okay right that's on the wrong side. Uh, go. The, my new favorite friend in there. Find the river. Oh gosh, you might even get it done. This way, that's really cool. Oh, it might drop out. Lots of things might happen. Yep. So that's just turn that down until it was weak and it just collapsed in on itself. And now we can 
this on. That hopefully, which will allow us to get to our pivot and we can begin straightening it up. Now, at some point, I'm going to have to shorten it because I've left it crazy too long. I was slightly uh, lily livered there in cutting it off. But um, so this, and of course, the problem with that is it's going to really invite um, it to work, work its way out of the hole. So, um, a little up here. Yeah, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, just now it's in the hole, hopefully, for the first and last time, I'm going to cut it down to length. So let's just triple check with our plate. Uh, find a bit of plate where it actually fits. Put a bit of blue on. Like that. Just easiest way to mark it is just to do it like this. Uh, of course, we've got um, end shake as well, but we do we have an oil sink. Yeah, we've got a pretty, um, maybe you can't see it there. We've got a pretty meaty oil sink here. Remember that good old bush that's in there, one of those, might be one of those bronze things. Um, you know, we're leaving that in there. We might open the hole up a little bit. Um, but we know that if we cut it to plate thickness, then we're going to be laughing because um, we, um, we've got the oil sink. So it's definitely not going to be in uh, inside the bearing and people aren't going to write to me with um, hate mail about the fact that it, the world's going to come to an end. I hope, anyway. So, just about sneak in there. Just going to sharpen up that uh, graver because it's quite blunt. It's going to use uh, the old diamond easy lap, whatever it's called, which. Um, Still haven't done my video on them yet. The weeks just go by so quickly that the videos are um, the videos are slow coming out. And um, junior member of Open Clock Club team uh, is on my back about it quite rightly. Yeah, it's just not it. Get the videos out. Sorry. Do you have some questions about glue? About glue. Okay. Oh. Jeremy and Ian would have glued it. Right. Yeah. More patience. Yeah. I'm having so much to it. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, in the old days, if you can be bothered to read those books, they uh, they talk about using oil stone dust, don't they? So they kind of jam the pivot in a hole with a bit of uh, oil stone dust. So, I, you know, I, I have nothing against gluing it at all, I think. Uh, um, you know, no problem with glue in the slightest. What I wouldn't do, though, is get into the habit, he said, making it sound like a bad habit, whatever one of those is, of sort of having a sloppy pivot that's glued in and then you begin to turn it. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but um, uh, I think the beauty of doing it like this and having that very, very slight taper at the beginning is that it's really great for learning and improving your uh, graver and turning technique, which is cool for fitting things together um, all together. So,
I have actually learned a new another new thing this week with this um cutting off this blue steel with doing more pivoting. If you just get the graver and you kind of just keep driving it in, as I said, eventually, because you've got such a like with a lathe tool, I suppose, you've got so much um contact area that it tips the graver down and breaks the tip off. Whereas if you put the tip in and then on the side that's waste, sort of rotate it away and cut cut makes sense, rotate it away you cut much quicker and much more successfully. So now the coat looks too short, but anyway, um, we've got a big old chunky oil sink there. But um, top maybe didn't have oil sinks when it was new. Don't, there we are. Don't fit oil sinks if you didn't have oil sinks in the first place. As we know, oil sink is not a reservoir for oil, which begs the question, what is an oil sink for? Nobody knows. More on glue. More on glue. Yeah, Ian says when you have most of the Loctite supply in Yorkshire, why wouldn't you use it? Because it's nice to have it in stock. It's that warm feeling of um of having something in stock. And, and Jeremy says, can you get glue in Yorkshire? Glue, yeah, they buy. Oh, don't let don't let open clock club vegan here, but they boil up but poor old animals. Yeah, that's huh? what Ian suggested. Probably fish or animal based. Yeah, in Yorkshire. definitely. Understandable. Where this, uh, yeah. Um, you can see from the bit of pivot that we stuck in that it's uh, quite sort of, we've got that taper on it, but it's also very fractionally wobbly, which is perfect because we can now proceed to turn that down. I can get in there. It's all a bit tight, but um, that's, that's uh, absolutely spot on. How much time have we got? Oh. We're doing okay, he says. Right, so I'm just going to um, chew it up. Right, okay, so next part of chewing it up. So this pivot, obviously, I jammed it in the hole, wobbling a little bit, but hopefully uh, sound without any glue on there. If you put your graver flat against it to turn it true, you'll never turn it true. All that will happen is that it'll get smaller and smaller diameter, but it'll continue to be wobbly. So all you have to do is to get a very pointy graver or something and jab that in, uh, resting against the T-rest several times moving along. So you get an incredibly rough surface, but it's concentric. Then you get the graver with a flat edge and take it down. So um, I'm just gonna go back to this one and do that and chew it up. So just chew it up with a point, touch it, touch it, move it along, touch it. And then once it's true, then you can begin to make it uh, cylindrical. I don't know whether you can hear on the microphone, but it's kind of going. Chick, 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 chick. In fact, irrespective of whether you can see it even, you can hear that it's eccentric and the minute that it starts to sound cutting evenly, then you know that you've created something that's at least more, um, more concentric. Right, so that's running nice and true now. So I'm just going to start to reduce the diameter and get those turning marks out. Matthew, can you push your hair back? Sorry. I know. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Uh, that's slightly tricky because I can't really see. I'll fly by wire, get my hair out of the way, which is like nearly impossible. It is actually impossible. Oh well, at least you can see. I'll do. I'll move that like that. And maybe I need a headband. I used to have one. I don't, I don't know where it went. 
Van Damme, yeah. I know what you're going to say next. Don't say it. <laughs> Is that still bad? Blocking, blocking. Uh, no, it's not better, thank you. Sorry, you know, it's all very, uh, a bit up close and personal. So you get one of those binocular microscopes. Good, looking good. Um, let's just have a measure up. Can't even remember what we agreed. I think we agreed 1.5, didn't we, last week or something. Or some committee that met. Uh, I think it's bigger than that at the moment still. I don't know, it's not. Oh, there you go. It's 1.4 and a bit. So great. We can now, it's reasonably parallel. If you can see there, looking okay. Uh, let's just stone it a bit and um, we'll be good to go. I don't know whether I can do that in here. Yeah, probably can. I'm just going to... Uh, hmm. Just punch that over there. Um, focus. There we go. So I'm just going to um, stone it now. Our old friend, the uh, Degusit, Degusit stone. So I've moved this part of the thing, uh, the lantern runner, round. Don't want to block your view, heaven forbid. But um, can still just about see it under there like that and so we should be able to get this underneath and again this is really cool because rather like the uh, ceramic stone if you clean it first by sort of grinding the two things together a it flattens it out but more importantly maybe you can see where the pivot touches because it leaves a little black mark. And I'm going to be, uh, well, actually, um, just so um, <clears throat> to prove I'm reasonably open minded, I'm actually using a, a pivot burnish. I know, I want. There we are. Came out the hole. Ah, dear. What's the name of the tool in your tailstock? Lantern runner. Ah, it's going so well. So the question is, can I, I don't think I can, refit it and it be concentric? Probably not with a bit of glue. I think the best thing to do is to redo it, but as we're kind of running out of time today. So whoever said glue it was right. <laughs> I'll make it a bit deeper, actually, I think was a really the, the even better thing to do is just to um, uh, stone it a bit more. So it went right down or nearer to the bottom of the hole. But anyway, I didn't do that. So there you go. This a, seems like a really good fit, but obviously it's not that good of a fit, is it? Glue in my eye. Now you don't want to put glue in the hole, obviously, because it'll end up with hydraulic uh, action. It'll just push the pivot out again. What I would normally do is to actually probably start again but um is to clean it of course because it's maybe got a bit of oil on there 
I didn't clean it as I went along, but. Right, good old industrial solution. It is actually incredibly tight. I'm surprised it came out, but there you go. Right, a bit of uh, pith wood on there. And just going to, yeah, lantern runner, that thing's called, I think, with the uh, holes in it, a bit like a lantern pinion. I'm going to change that for this uh, thing. I don't think this, strictly speaking, is a Jacko tool, but uh, I'm going to call it a Jacko tool. And it's got little numbered notches in the edge. And we know we want about, I don't know whether it actually goes big enough for this. goes up to 1.3 so let's uh, call that close enough like that you see it's um i don't think it's going to touch is it because the whole point is that we'll see anyway i'll get a pivot burnisher just put a bit of oil on it As you know, I don't believe in finishing pivots on old clocks at all. But as this is a new pivot, let's just give it a little bit of a file. And a little bit of a burnish. There we go. And, uh, so there we are. A couple of little lines on there. Okay. So um, normally, obviously, I wouldn't do it that way. I would um, make another bit of steel that went in the hole a bit deeper. But I think that's actually all right. It's just got a little bit of Really quite firm, nice and concentric, reasonably polished up. I could spend a bit more time doing that, but um, not particularly motivated by that. So moment of truth, let's see if it uh, fits in the frame. So I think we did um, nominally agree that we would broach out the hole if it's a bit tight. Just get a pencil. So I know where we are. Yeah, it's, it's just about to go in the hole, but a little bit tight. So because it's been bushed, now if it hadn't been bushed, then I would have to go back and turn the pivot down a bit. But I'm reasonably uh, happy to open up the hole uh, a bit, uh, whatever it takes. It's a pretty tiny amount. So let's just find a brooch. What's a jacko drum? Uh, well, a jacko tool is um, what we, they call in the trade, jokingly, a pivot breaking tool. It's a tool used for finishing uh, watch pivots primarily. And um, I think that's the jacko drum, wherever it's gone. The, uh, this thing. Yeah. Ian will know. Yeah, Ian says it's a jacko drum. Yeah, so that's a jacko drum. So it's got these grooves in the edge into which the pivot sits. And you can just see the numbered. So um, if you ever get the money, buy a set of Steiner turns. They're really incredible tool, mainly for watchmaking and small stuff, but they're so beautifully made. And they have these little dimples in the edge with numbers on them. So if you file down, this is for new making, by the way, not for 
um, polishing up the pivots of old clocks, um, you file down or burnish down to that diameter, you know it is the number that it says on the drum. So it's the same thing as that, really, uh, really useful. Oh, gosh, wrecking the joint now. Let's just um, open up this hole. So I remember when your brooch has got glue on it, so it's obviously been used for <laughs> something else. When you're broaching, remember your uh, uprighting is really important. So that's the perpendicular nature of um, the brooch in relation to the plate. Brooch has either got so much glue on it or it's completely blunt or both. I think that's one of those bronze bushes that you can buy. It's really hard, which I suppose is a suppose is a good thing. Right. So when you're broaching, the pivots just now begin to stick in the hole. You can see that. So we now begin to broach from both sides. Um, so we end up with a with a hole with um, a really uh, small crest in the middle of a bearing with a small crest in the middle of it. So nearly in the hole now. So just keep broaching from both sides. Checking for uprighting the whole time. So checking that brooch is perpendicular to the frame. So we've now got that position um, in the books. They talk about five degrees, sort of two and a half degrees either side of um, perpendicular. We've got to check that it will go past the perpendicular, given that the hole on the other side of the frame is, of course, opposite in both directions. This is um, one of the major faults with bushing that people run into, is that they bush the hole um, and the wheel wobbles about, but it's not going past perpendicular. So when you put the other plate on, of course, there's no side check and the clock will stop. So. Let's just find the plate. I'll do a different lens on the camera for showing this. It's all a bit squidged in, isn't it? But so there you go. Uh, looks good. So the key test, remember, sorry, yeah, I could do it to zoom out of it, but I can't, is the arbor, can you hear it? Must fall freely from one side to the other. There's no oil on it, of course, and the same in this direction. Can you hear it? Click in. So you can see the wheels buckled on its pinion. It's been dished across to try and make it run on a new bit of um, pinion. So it looks ugly, but as much as it'll probably induce a little sinusoidal error in the timekeeper and the clock, you're not going to notice that. I'm not going to try and straighten it up. It's it's not wobbly. It's just somebody's... Anyway, you couldn't make it up, could you? So there we are. So we've got a bit of end shake. Good. And then must do that. Once you've spun the wheel, must... Um, you hear it? If it doesn't do that, do not proceed without sorting it out because the clock will stop. And the problem with bushed holes is that they um, they tend not to stop straight away. It takes a while for the oil to move and then the hole begins to bind up. And so your client rings up in three months time and, um, and they say, oh, that clock stopped. So just in the last three minutes, one more job to do. Then we've finished that. As I say, I'm not obviously entirely happy with the, the pivot being glued in like that, but it seems really sound and um, 
we'll we'll give it a little bit of a jab next week and see what it looks like. So the last thing to do is to find my pegwood again. I'll get a new piece. Really important job this when you've uh, done any bushing, which we haven't, of course, but we have opened up the hole a little bit, is just to take everything apart and get a bit of steel wool. Crazy big piece there, but small piece of steel wool on your pegwood. And without marking the plate, just deburr. I'm going to deburr on both sides because we broach on both sides. But that it's like, you know, if you have problems with clocks that you're repairing, they stop. That's kind of like one of the best tips I can give you. Obviously, you'll clean the clock again after, which we will do in the end. So, um, yeah, deeper with steel wool, really useful top tip. Um, so there we go. Just turn it around. Da, da, da. Oh, you can see the lovely pivoting job. So. There we are. What did we learn? Um, as always with the pivoting, get the hole as deep as you reasonably can. I think putting that bush round is really useful, prevents it from splitting the app, prevents the arbor from splitting. Um, maybe my pivot should have been a bit more parallel. If I get time during the week, uh, I'll redo it. But I imagine now with that glue on, it's going to take a bit of heat to get it out. So may well leave it there. Um, and then you can see here, we did have to open the bush up a little bit. So, um, you know, that's OK. It's 1.4 millimeter diameter now. Um, but otherwise, I think, uh, do you remember the arbor was all bent? Still a wee little wobble on it here, but it's not significant. I'm, I'm happy with that. And as I said, um, if I can find the... third wheel or the upper intermediate wheel as it's now known um, let's just have a look before we go how that meshes got a bit of um crazy bushing on the inside there which i'm not bothered about but just uh, uh would help on it put it in the right hole would help So our, um, remember our bushing thing, just check. Is it better when they're pushed together, uh, right, correct direction, or apart, or neutral? It's actually very fractionally better. Um, there's not a lot on it. It's maybe fractionally better when they're pushed together. So maybe... If the clock doesn't run, we might look at that upper intermediate wheel, rear pivot, and uh, decide to bush it. But um, for the time being, I'm perfectly happy with it. So there we are. I think we can take that off our list. Um, all a bit rough and ready, but uh, we got there in the end. Uh, I don't quite know what's next. I think we'll um, third wheel looks fine. So next week we'll be on to the escapement. We've dealt with that in Open Clock Club as well. So we'll try and kind of rattle through refacing the pallets if indeed they need doing. But um, uh, there we go. Never spin the wheels. Totally. You'll never get that time back. Anyway, thank you to two members of uh, Open Team Open Clock Club this week. And thank you for everybody for joining along and humoring me. Uh, really appreciate your support. We look forward to seeing you on Facebook group uh, as always. And we hopefully will see you on Saturday evening at uh, 1800 hours British summer time. Um, for those of you who are not in, in the UK, really love your company. And um, we'll hopefully see you on Saturday. If not, we'll see you next Thursday where we'll be moving up the train to the escapement and maybe the next week or the week after we can begin to think about getting that going train actually up and running and on test so from us here in still sunny york uh really lovely to see you and we'll see you again soon bye are you going to sign off harriet please
Just, just type. No, just type. Oh, right, literally. Yeah. Still doing something. Yeah, you, you, you just sign off. Yeah, I've done it. All right. <sighs> Music diary. What I need to you. Every single night.